The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 3, by Edgar Allan Poe. The Spectacles, Part 1. Many years ago, it was the fashion to ridicule the idea of love at first sight. But those who think, not less than those who feel deeply, have always advocated its existence. Modern discoveries, indeed, in what may be termed ethical magnetism or magnetoesthetics, render it probable that the most natural and consequently the truest and most intense of the human affections are those which arise in the heart as if by electric sympathy. In a word, that the brightest and most enduring of the psychal fetters are those which are riveted by a glance. The confession I am about to make will add another to the already almost innumerable instances of the truth of the position. My story requires that I should be somewhat minute. I am still a very young man, not yet twenty-two years of age. My name, at present, is a very unusual and rather plebeian one, Simpson. I say, at present, for it is only lately that I have been so called, having legislatively adopted this surname within the last year, in order to receive a large inheritance left me by a distant male relative Adolphus Simpson, Esquire. The bequest was conditioned upon my taking the name of the testator, the family, not the Christian name. My Christian name is Napoleon Bonaparte, or, more properly, these are my first and middle appellations. I assume the name, Simpson, with some reluctance, as, in my true patronym, Froissart, I felt a very pardonable pride, believing that I could trace a descent from the immortal author of The Chronicles. Well, on the subject of names, by the by, I may mention a singular coincidence of sound attending the names of some of my immediate predecessors. My father was a Monsieur Froissart of Paris. His wife, my mother, whom he married at fifteen, was a Mademoiselle Croissart, eldest daughter of Croissart the banker, whose wife, again, being only sixteen when married, was the eldest daughter of one Victor Voissart. Monsieur Voissart, very singularly, had married a lady of similar name, a Mademoiselle Moissart. She, too, was quite a child when married, and her mother, also Madame Moissart, was only fourteen when led to the altar. These early marriages are usual in France. Here, however, are Moissart, Voissart, Croissart, and Froissart, all in the direct line of descent. My own name, though, as I say, became Simpson by act of legislature, and with so much repugnance on my part that, at one period, I actually hesitated about accepting the legacy with the useless and annoying proviso attached. As to personal endowments, I am by no means deficient. On the contrary, I believe that I am well made, and possess what nine-tenths of the world would call a handsome face. In height I am five feet eleven. My hair is black and curling. My nose is sufficiently good. My eyes are large and gray, and although, in fact, they are weak, a very inconvenient degree, still no defect in this regard would be suspected from their appearance. The weakness itself, however, has always much annoyed me, and I have resorted to every remedy, short of wearing glasses. Being youthful and good-looking, I naturally dislike these, and have resolutely refused to employ them. I know nothing, indeed, which so disfigures the countenance of a young person, or so impresses every feature with an air of demureness, if not altogether of sanctimoniousness and of age. An eyeglass, on the other hand, has a savor of downright foppery and affectation. I have hitherto managed as well as I could without either. But something too much of these merely personal details, which, after all, are of little importance— I will content myself with saying, in addition, that my temperament is sanguine, rash, ardent, enthusiastic, and that all my life I have been a devoted admirer of the women. One night last winter I entered a box at the P. Theatre in company with a friend, Mr. Talbot. It was an opera night, and the bills presented a very rare attraction, so that the house was excessively crowded. We were in time, however, to obtain the front seats which had been reserved for us, and into which, with some little difficulty, we elbowed our way. For two hours my companion, who was a musical fanatico, gave his undivided attention to the stage, and in the meantime I amused myself by observing the audience, which consisted in chief part of the very elite of the city. Having satisfied myself upon this point, I was about turning my eyes to the prima donna, 
when they were arrested and riveted by a figure in one of the private boxes which had escaped my observation. If I live a thousand years, I can never forget the intense emotion with which I regarded this figure. It was that of a female, the most exquisite I had ever beheld. The face was so far turned toward the stage that, for some minutes, I could not obtain a view of it. But the form was divine. No other word can sufficiently express its magnificent proportion. And even the term divine seems ridiculously feeble as I write it. The magic of a lovely form and woman, the necromancy of female gracefulness, was always a power which I had found it impossible to resist. But here was grace personified, incarnate, the beau ideal of my wildest and most enthusiastic visions. The figure, almost all of which the construction of the box permitted to be seen, was somewhat above the medium height, and nearly approached without positively reaching the majestic. Its perfect fullness and tournure were delicious. The head, of which only the back was visible, rivaled in outline that of the Greek psyche, and was rather displayed than concealed by an elegant cap of gauze arienne, which put me in mind of the ventum textilem of Apuleius. The right arm hung over the balustrade of the box, and thrilled every nerve of my frame with its exquisite symmetry. Its upper portion was draperied by one of the loose, open sleeves now in fashion. This extended but little below the elbow. Beneath it was worn an under one of some frail material, close-fitting, and terminated by a cuff of rich lace, which fell gracefully over the top of the hand, revealing only the delicate fingers, upon one of which sparkled a diamond ring, which I at once saw was of extraordinary value. The admirable roundness of the wrist was well set off by a bracelet which encircled it, and which also was ornamented and clasped by a magnificent aigrette of jewels, telling, in words they could not be mistaken, at once of the wealth and fastidious taste of the wearer. I gazed at this queenly apparition for at least half an hour, as if I had been suddenly converted to stone. And during this period I felt the full force and truth of all that has been said or sung concerning love at first sight. My feelings were totally different from any which I had hitherto experienced in the presence of even the most celebrated specimens of female loveliness. An unaccountable and what I am compelled to consider a magnetic sympathy of soul for soul seemed to rivet not only my vision, but my whole powers of thought and feeling upon the admirable object before me. I saw, I felt, I knew that I was deeply, madly, irrevocably in love, and this even before seeing the face of the person beloved. So intense, indeed, was the passion that consumed me, that I really believe it would have received little, if any, abatement, had the features yet unseen proved of merely ordinary character. So anomalous is the nature of the only true love, of the love at first sight, and so little really dependent is it upon the external conditions which only seem to create and control it. While I was thus wrapped in admiration of this lovely vision, a sudden disturbance among the audience caused her to turn her head partially toward me, so that I beheld the entire profile of the face. Its beauty even exceeded my anticipations, and yet there was something about it which disappointed me, without my being able to tell exactly what it was. I said disappointed, but this is not altogether the word. My sentiments were at once quieted and exalted. They partook less of transport and more of calm enthusiasm and of enthusiastic repose. This state of feeling arose, perhaps, from the Madonna-like and matronly air of the face, and yet I had once understood that it could not have arisen entirely from this. There was something else, some mystery which I could not develop, some expression about the countenance which slightly disturbed me while it greatly heightened my interest. In fact, I was just in that condition of mind which prepares a young and susceptible man for any act of extravagance. Had the lady been alone, I should undoubtedly have entered her box and accosted her at all hazards. But, fortunately, she was attended by two companions, a gentleman and a strikingly beautiful woman, to all appearance a few years younger than herself. I revolved in my mind a thousand schemes by which I might obtain, hereafter, an introduction to the elder lady, or, for the present, at all events, a more distinct view of her beauty. 
I would have removed my position to one nearer her own, but the crowded state of the theatre rendered this impossible, and the stern decrees of fashion had, of late, imperatively prohibited the use of the opera-glass in a case such as this, even had I been so fortunate as to have one with me, but I had not, and was thus in despair. At length I bethought me of applying to my companion. "'Talbot,' I said, "'you have an opera-glass. Let me have it.' "'An opera-glass? No! What do you suppose I would be doing with an opera-glass?' Here he turned impatiently toward the stage. "'But, Talbot,' I continued, pulling him by the shoulder, "'listen to me, will you? Do you see the stage? Box! There! No, the next! Did you ever behold as lovely a woman?' "'She is very beautiful, no doubt,' he said. "'I wonder who she can be.' "'Why, in the name of all that is angelic, don't you know who she is? "'Not to know her argues yourself unknown. "'She is the celebrated Madame Lalande, "'the beauty of the day par excellence, and the talk of the whole town, "'immensely wealthy, too, a widow and a great match, "'has just arrived from Paris. "'Do you know her? "'Yes, I have the honor. "'Will you introduce me? "'Assuredly, with the greatest pleasure. "'When shall it be?' "'Tomorrow, at one, I will call upon you at B's. "'Very good, and now do hold your tongue if you can.' "'In this latter respect, I was forced to take Talbot's advice, "'for he remained obstinately deaf to every further question or suggestion, "'and occupied himself exclusively for the rest of the evening "'with what was transacting upon the stage. "'In the meantime, I kept my eyes riveted on Madame Lalande, "'and at length had the good fortune to obtain a full front view of her face.' It was exquisitely lovely. This, of course, my heart had told me before, even had not Talbot fully satisfied me upon the point, but still the unintelligible something disturbed me. I finally concluded that my senses were impressed by a certain air of gravity, a sadness, or, still more properly, of weariness, which took something from the youth and freshness of the countenance only to endow it with a seraphic tenderness and majesty, and thus, of course, to my enthusiastic and romantic temperament, with an interest tenfold. While I thus feasted my eyes, I perceived, at last, to my great trepidation, by an almost imperceptible start on the part of the lady, that she had become suddenly aware of the intensity of my gaze. Still, I was absolutely fascinated, and could not withdraw it, even for an instant, she turned aside her face, and again I saw only the chiseled contour of the back portion of the head. After some minutes, as if urged by curiosity to see if I was still looking, she gradually brought her face again around, and again encountered my burning gaze. Her large, dark eyes fell instantly, and a deep blush mantled her cheek. But what was my astonishment at perceiving that she not only did not a second time avert her head— but that she actually took from her girdle a double eyeglass, elevated it, adjusted it, and then regarded me through it intently and deliberately for the space of several minutes. Had a thunderbolt fallen at my feet, I could not have been more thoroughly astounded, astounded only, not offended or disgusted in the slightest degree, although an action so bold in any other woman would have been likely to offend or disgust, but the whole thing was done with so much quietude, so much nonchalance, so much repose, with so evident an air of the highest breeding and short, that nothing of mere effrontery was perceptible, and my sole sentiments were those of admiration and surprise. I observed that, upon her first elevation of the glass, she had seemed satisfied with a momentary inspection of my person, and was withdrawing the instrument when, as if struck by a second thought, she resumed it, and so continued to regard me with fixed attention for the space of several minutes, for five minutes at the very least, I am sure. This action, so remarkable in an American theater, attracted very general observation, and gave rise to an indefinite movement, or buzz, among the audience, which, for a moment, filled me with confusion, but produced no visible effect upon the countenance of Madame Lalande. Having satisfied her curiosity, if such it was, she dropped the glass, and quietly gave her attention again to the stage, her profile now being turned toward myself as before. I continued to watch her unremittingly, although I was fully conscious of my rudeness in so doing. Presently I saw the head slowly and slightly change its position, 
and soon I became convinced that the lady, while pretending to look at the stage, was, in fact, attentively regarding myself. It is needless to say what effect this conduct on the part of so fascinating a woman had upon my excitable mind. Having thus scrutinized me for perhaps a quarter of an hour, the fair object of my passion addressed the gentleman who attended her, and while she spoke I saw distinctly, by the glances of both, that the conversation had reference to myself. Upon its conclusion, Madame Lalande again turned toward the stage, and, for a few minutes, seemed absorbed in the performance. At the expiration of this period, however, I was thrown into an extremity of agitation by seeing her unfold, for the second time, the eyeglass which hung at her side, fully confront me as before, and, disregarding the renewed buzz of the audience, survey me from head to foot with the same miraculous composer which had previously so delighted and confounded my soul. This extraordinary behavior, by throwing me into a perfect fever of excitement, into an absolute delirium of love, served rather to embolden than to disconcert me. In the mad intensity of my devotion I forgot everything but the presence and the majestic loveliness of the vision which confronted my gaze. Watching my opportunity, when I thought the audience were fully engaged with the opera, I at length caught the eyes of Madame Lalonde, and upon the instant made a slight but unmistakable bow. She blushed very deeply, then averted her eyes, then slowly and cautiously looked around, apparently to see if my rash action had been noticed, then leaned over toward the gentleman who sat by her side. I now felt a burning sense of the impropriety I had committed, and expected nothing less than instant exposure, while a vision of pistols upon the morrow floated rapidly and uncomfortably through my brain. I was greatly and immediately relieved, however, when I saw the lady merely hand the gentleman a playbill, without speaking. But the reader may form some feeble conception of my astonishment, of my profound amazement, my delirious bewilderment of heart and soul, when, instantly afterward, having again glanced furtively around, she allowed her bright eyes to set fully and steadily upon my own, and then, with a faint smile disclosing a bright line of her pearly teeth, made two distinct, pointed, and unequivocal affirmative inclinations of the head. It is useless, of course, to dwell upon my joy, upon my transport, upon my illimitable ecstasy of the heart. If ever man was mad with excess of happiness, it was myself at that moment. I loved. This was my first love, so I felt it to be. It was love supreme, indescribable. It was love at first sight. And at first sight, too, it had been appreciated and returned. Yes, returned. How and why should I doubt it for an instant? What other construction could I possibly put upon such conduct on the part of a lady so beautiful, so wealthy, evidently so accomplished, of so high breeding, of so lofty a position in society, in every regard so entirely respectable as I felt assured was Madame Lalande? Yes, she loved me. She returned the enthusiasm of my love with an enthusiasm as blind, as uncompromising, as uncalculating, as abandoned, and as utterly unbounded as my own. These delicious fancies and reflections, however, were now interrupted by the falling of the drop curtain. The audience arose, and the usual tumult immediately supervened. Quitting Talbot abruptly, I made every effort to force my way into closer proximity with Madame Lalande. Having failed in this on account of the crowd, I at length gave up the chase and bent my steps homeward, consoling myself for my disappointment in not having been able to touch even the hem of her robe by the reflection that I should be introduced by Talbot in due form upon the morrow. This morrow at last came, that is to say, a day finally dawned upon a long and weary night of impatience, and then the hours until one were snail-paced, dreary, and innumerable. But even Stamboul, it is said, shall have an end, and there came an end to this long delay. The clock struck. As the last echo ceased, I stepped into B's and inquired for Talbot. Out, said the footman, Talbot's own. Out, I replied, staggering back half a dozen paces. Let me tell you, my fine fellow, that this thing is thoroughly impossible and impracticable. Mr. Talbot is not out. What do you mean? "'Nothing, sir. 
Only Mr. Talbot is not in, that's all. He rode over to S. immediately after breakfast, and left word that he would not be in town again for a week. I stood petrified with horror and rage. I endeavored to reply, but my tongue refused its office. At length I turned on my heel, livid with wrath, and inwardly consigning the whole tribe of the Talbots to the innermost regions of Erebus. It was evident that my inconsiderate friend, Il Fanatico, had quite forgotten his appointment with myself, had forgotten it as soon as it was made. At no time was he a very scrupulous man of his word. There was no help for it. So, smothering my vexation as well as I could, I strolled moodily up the street, propounding futile inquiries about Madame Lalande to every male acquaintance I met. By report she was known, I found, to all. To many, by sight. But she had been in town only a few weeks, and there were very few, therefore, who claimed her personal acquaintance. These few, being still comparatively strangers, could not, or would not, take the liberty of introducing me through the formality of a morning call. While I stood thus in despair, conversing with a trio of friends upon the all-absorbing subject of my heart, it so happened that the subject itself passed by. "'As I live, there she is!' cried one. "'Surprisingly beautiful!' exclaimed a second. "'An angel upon the earth!' ejaculated a third. I looked, and in an open carriage which approached us, passing slowly down the street, sat the enchanting vision of the opera, accompanied by the younger lady, who had occupied a portion of her box. "'Her companion also wears remarkably well,' said the one of my trio who had spoken first. "'Astonishingly,' said the second, "'still quite a brilliant air, but uh, art will do wonders. Upon my word she looks better than she did at Paris five years ago.' A beautiful woman still. Don't you think so, Froissart? Uh, Simpson, I mean? Still, said I, and why shouldn't she be? But compared with her friend, she is as a rush, light to the evening star, a glow-worm to Antares. Ha, ha, ha! Why, Simpson, you have an astonishing tact at making discoveries. Original ones, I mean. And here we separated while one of the trio began humming a gay vaudeville of which I caught only the lines, Ninon, 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 Abba, Abba, Ninon de l'enclos. During this little scene, however, one thing had served greatly to console me, although it fed the passion by which I was consumed. As the carriage of Madame Lalande rolled by our group, I had observed that she recognized me, and more than this, she had blessed me by the most seraphic of all imaginable smiles, with no equivocal mark of the recognition. As for an introduction, I was obliged to abandon all hope of it until such time as Talbot should think proper to return from the country. In the meantime, I perseveringly frequented every reputable place of public amusement, and at length at the theatre where I first saw her, I had the supreme bliss of meeting her, and of exchanging glances with her once again. This did not occur, however, until the lapse of a fortnight. Every day, in the interim, I had inquired for Talbot at his hotel, and every day had been thrown into a spasm of wrath by the everlasting not-come-home-yet of his footman. Upon the evening in question, therefore, I was in a condition little short of madness. Madame Lalande, I had been told, was a Parisian, had lately arrived from Paris. Might she not suddenly return? Return before Talbot came back? And might she not be thus lost to me forever? The thought was too terrible to bear. Since my future happiness was at issue, I resolved to act with a manly decision. In a word, upon the breaking up of the play, I traced the lady to her residence, noted the address, and the next morning sent her a full and elaborate letter in which I poured out my whole heart. I spoke boldly, freely, in a word, I spoke with passion. I concealed nothing, nothing even of my weakness. I alluded to the romantic circumstances of our first meeting, even to the glances which had passed between us. I went so far as to say that I felt assured of her love. While I offered this assurance, and my own intensity of devotion, as two excuses for my otherwise unpardonable conduct. As a third, I spoke of my fear that she might quit the city before I could have the opportunity of a formal introduction. 
I concluded the most wildly enthusiastic epistle ever penned with a frank declaration of my worldly circumstances, of my affluence, and with an offer of my heart and of my hand. In an agony of expectation, I awaited the reply. After what seemed the lapse of a century, it came. Yes, actually came. Romantic as all this may appear, I really received a letter from Madame Lalande, the beautiful, the wealthy, the idolized Madame Lalande. Her eyes, her magnificent eyes, had not belied her noble heart. Like a true French woman, as she was, she had obeyed the frank dictates of her reason, the generous impulses of her nature, despising the conventional pruderies of the world. She had not scorned my proposals. She had not sheltered herself in silence. She had not returned my letter unopened. She had even sent me, in reply, one penned by her own exquisite fingers. It ran thus. Monsieur Simpsonville, pardon me for not composed the beautiful tongue of his country so well as might. It is only the late that I am arrive, and not yet have the opportunity for to l'étudier. With this apology for the manière, I will now say that, Ella, Monsieur Simpson, have guessed about the two true. Need I say the more? Ella, am I not ready speak de tout moche? Eugenie Lalande. This noble-spirited note I kissed a million times, and committed, no doubt, on its account, a thousand other extravagances that have now escaped my memory. Still, Talbot would not return. Alas, could he have formed even the vaguest idea of the suffering his absence had occasioned his friend, would not his sympathizing nature have flown immediately to my relief? Still, however, he came not. I wrote, he replied. He was detained by urgent business, but would shortly return. He begged me not to be impatient, to moderate my transports, to read soothing books, to drink nothing stronger than hawk, and to bring the consolations of philosophy to my aid. The fool! If he could not come himself, why, in the name of everything rational, could he not have enclosed me a letter of presentation? I wrote him again, entreating him to forward one forthwith. My letter was returned by that footman with the following endorsement in pencil. The scoundrel had joined his master in the country. Left S yesterday for parts unknown, did not say where or when be back, so thought best to return letter knowing your handwriting and as how you is always more or less in a hurry. Your sincerely, Stubbs. After this, it is needless to say that I devoted to the infernal deities both master and valet. But there was little use in anger and no consolation at all in complaint. But I had yet a resource left in my constitutional audacity. Hitherto it had served me well, and I now resolved to make it avail me to the end. Besides, after the correspondence which had passed between us, what act of mere informality could I commit within bounds? that ought to be regarded as indecorous by Madame Lalande. Since the affair of the letter, I had been in the habit of watching her house, and thus discovered that, about twilight, it was her custom to promenade, attended only by a negro in livery, in a public square overlooked by her windows. Here, amid the luxuriant and shadowing groves, in the gray gloom of a sweet midsummer evening, I observed my opportunity and accosted her. The better to deceive the servant in attendance, I did this with the assured air of an old and familiar acquaintance. With a presence of mind truly Parisian, she took the cue at once and, to greet me, held out the most bewitchingly little of hands. The valet at once fell into the rear, and now, with hearts full to overflowing, we discoursed long and unreservedly of our love. As Madame Lalande spoke English even less fluently than she wrote it, our conversation was necessarily in French. In this sweet tongue so adapted to passion, I gave loose to the impetuous enthusiasm of my nature, and, with all the eloquence I could command, besought her to consent to an immediate marriage. At this impatience she smiled. She urged the old story of decorum, that bugbear which deters so many from bliss until the opportunity for bliss has forever gone by. 
I had most imprudently made it known among my friends, she observed, that I desired her acquaintance, thus that I did not possess it, thus, again, there was no possibility of concealing the date of our first knowledge of each other. And then she adverted, with a blush, to the extreme recency of this date. To wed immediately would be improper, would be indecorous, would be outré. All this she said with a charming air of naivete, which enraptured while it grieved and convinced me. She went even so far as to accuse me laughingly of rashness, of imprudence. She bade me remember that I really even know not who she was. What were her prospects, her connections, her standing in society? She begged me, but with a sigh, to reconsider my proposal, and termed my love an infatuation, a will-o'-the-wisp, a fancy or fantasy of the moment, a baseless and unstable creation rather of the imagination than of the heart. These things she uttered as the shadows of the sweet twilight gathered darkly and more darkly around us, and then, with a gentle pressure of her fairy-like hand, overthrew, in a single sweet instant, all the argumentative fabric she had reared.